This is Shopify Masters, the e-commerce marketing podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs. It's powered by Shopify, the easiest way to sell online, in person, and anywhere in between. To get an extended 30-day trial, visit shopify.com slash masters. Hey entrepreneurs, my name is Felix and I'm the host of the Shopify Masters podcast. Each week we put out podcast interviews with successful e-commerce entrepreneurs or experts to give you inspiration, motivation, and actionable tips to increase your traffic and sales so your store can generate the sales you need to live the life you want. In the last episode, Zach Hopstepfell from Mission Belt told the story of how he started a business that's donated $1 million to other entrepreneurs. In this episode, you'll learn from an entrepreneur that launches new products very quickly. In this episode, you'll learn why an original product needs to have familiar elements, how to balance your day job with your passion project, and how to keep the two worlds separate, and how to project how much inventory you should have on hand. Today, I'm joined by Mike McAdan from thisisground.com. That's T-H-I-S-I-S-G-R-O-U-N-D.com. This is Ground sells leather, tech, and travel accessories and was started in 2013 and based out of LA, California. Welcome, Mike. Hey there, Felix. What's going on? Hey, how's it going? So, um, yeah, super excited to have you on. Um, so, you know, I gave, a, I guess, a very quick uh, overview of your store, of your background. But, you know, tell us a little bit more about your store. Maybe what are some of the most popular products that you sell? Well, I would have to say the very first product, which really kicked off the business, uh, it's called the Cord Taco, which was literally inspired by a taco. <laughs> and all of our kind of universal frustrations around getting cords tangled. That's probably, that was the first one and continues to be very popular. Beyond that, we have, you know, since we did the Cord Taco, we, we received such a positive reaction to that that we've ventured into larger organiz- organizers that um, most definitely take care of a lot of the tech gear that we travel that we travel with every day or carry around the city with every day. But then also, um, my background is design, so I tend to spoil creative um, people that work in creative arts, not just digital design, but also just people that make stuff in general. So people that use their hands to make stuff, whether it be chefs or hairstylists or um, illustrators, architects, I tend to uh, spoil those crowds quite a bit. Mm, so you, you said you have a background in design. Is this the first business or first product that you've designed and tried to sell? Or what's like your background been in with entrepreneurship? Yeah, I mean, the majority of my career was definitely in digital, working on websites and mobile apps and desktop apps. And so this is most definitely the first, um, the first business of my own that had a, a consumer good associated with it. We certainly use tech as, as a vehicle for you know, discovery and, and then to buy it ultimately. But, but um, the only other you know, businesses that um, I was involved with where there was some consumer goods involved were just before this, I helped launch a business called Dollar Shave Club, which is a subscription business for razor blades. And so I, I definitely helped on, on that. But prior to that, it was pretty much just all digital. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of listeners out there know about, hopefully know about Dollar Shave Club. You guys have really, or that business has really gone, gone to the forefront in the last few years. So I want to talk about that in a second. Uh, but let's talk about, again, your very first product, uh, the Core Taco. How did you come up with the idea behind this? Or maybe give us a little quick description for, you know, since it's audio only, give a quick description of what does the Core Taco do and how did you come up with the idea behind it? You know, so what the Core Taco does is it essentially allows you to take in-ear headphones, like, you know, the white earbuds that you get with your iPhone or, or really any, any earbuds that have a cord as, attached to it, it allows you to wrap them up and then to put them in this uh, little leather disc that has a snap on it and, and it acts just like a taco. So if you were to stuff this little round leather circle with the earbuds and snap it, you could then pop it in your backpack or your pocket or your you know daily carry. And what happens is you're your, your, your earphones all of a sudden have a home. They don't get tangled up. Um, it's a conversation piece. So when people travel and they pull their cord taco out, it definitely generates conversation on an airplane next to a stranger um, or on the train. And it, yeah, it's, um, it got started. It's kind of a funny thing. I mean, basically, uh, a friend of mine was doing a blog post for a, a design blog, a popular design blog. And she asked me to come up with a way to organize cables 
because uh, she was doing a, a desk makeover for someone. And essentially, I, I procrastinated. I kind of put this project off for quite a while. And then, and then one day in Los Angeles, I had some really delicious tacos with an investor. And the, the project was due the next day. So when I woke up the next morning in this kind of lucid, dreamy state, the, the two ideas came together. I was a little stressed about getting the uh, court organizer done. I, I wanted to do something original. And then I just had those delicious tacos. And I was kind of thinking to myself while lying in bed that the taco shell um, was, was so simple. It's just this round geometric form that evidently or, you know, does actually a lot of stuff. It's responsible for so much. You can stuff so many crazy ingredients in it and wrap it up, and it, and it does a fantastic job. So I jumped out of bed. I, I mocked one up using uh, aluminum foil and some scotch tape. And, and I put some earbuds in it, closed it up. And when I saw that there was some functionality there and then I saw that it basically acted like a taco, I Googled cord taco and nothing came up. So I, I very quickly um, made that happen. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's definitely cool. And it's like a product that when I looked at it, I was like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And living in New York, it's like a biggest issue for everyone that takes a subway because once you get to your stop, you're like just cramming your headphones into your pocket and that's definitely not the best way to carry it. Um, so what, how did you validate this? You know, because well, you have a Kickstarter campaign. We'll talk about that in a second. But were there any other, uh, I guess, did you bring it, do you do any other kind of market research, present it to anybody else to get a better understanding if there was an actual need for a product like this? I had a unique you know, opportunity, which was that, first of all, I wasn't exactly setting out to start a business selling cord tacos. I actually wasn't even trying to necessarily innovate. You know, I wasn't sitting down trying to solve that problem. It was one of these things that just happened out of the sheer need from my friend that was working on this piece, and then and then um, and those delicious tacos I had. So I had this great opportunity to then you know publish it out into this blog post, and it became you know, part of a larger uh, listicle. It was like number 19, I think, of 26 ideas on how to organize your desktop. And then when that blog post was published, the, the editor was telling me that I needed to put, uh, basically make that for sale. And so I, I opened an Etsy store and I put these cord tacos on there just to sort of appease the, um, the blog so that their readers could have a place to go buy it in case they wanted to buy some. And I honestly thought that I would, you know, maybe sell a few. So I even just mocked a few up out of, by hand. I, I cut them by hand in my kitchen just to have a few on hand to, um, to sell on my, in my Etsy shop. And then, and then lo and behold, it became one of the most popular sought after items in that blog post. And then after that blog post was published, a few other blogs started to reach out um, so I, had, I quickly set up an email, you know, address. It was like cord tacos at Gmail. And I was just doing all of these kind of ad hoc things just to almost like j- just, just to be able to respond and to, and to make everyone happy for a short period of time because I, I, had, I had a day job at that point. And um, I wasn't looking to, uh, to jump into anything else necessarily. And, and so a few of my favorite blogs – posted about the cord taco, um, Swiss miss and, um, design milk and, and a few other, you know, blogs that I kind of like have always read were talking about it. And I was kind of like thinking to my, I, I was thinking to myself that I, I think that we in this almost accidental way accomplish something that's really difficult to do when you design something, which is, you know, I've always thought that, you know, and this is what I've also read, is that when you design something that actually has some functionality to it, there's something clever about it, you know, that will appeal to people's hearts and minds. And it reminds them of something that they're very familiar with, in this case, a taco. Um, You know, you get all of these things that are aligned and, and all of a sudden, you know, you have a product. And so... I started losing my nights and weekends making these cord tacos because I was selling, you know, not a ton, but in the weeks to follow, the Etsy store definitely started to get some um, discovery by way of these blog posts. And then I would say about a month later, I, I, I uh, th- this is, by the way, pre 
um, me being on Shopify, but this is basically when I moved into Shopify. I was still in my, my Etsy store, and, and one morning um, my phone started to blow up, and I, I looked on um, where the traffic was coming from, and it was all coming from Uncrate. Uncrate had posted about the Cord Taco, and then, you know, that's when it, then I was like, you know, had to change everything. My approach to that point was making them all by hand in my, in my kitchen and my, my living room nights and weekends. And almost kind of in denial that <laughs> it was a little depressing, like that I, I had a very busy day job and then I would come home and, and have to, I'd have to do this, you know, days and or nights and weekends. And not that I was necessarily complaining. It was really wonderful to see people's reactions um, to it. But then, um, you know, after I saw, I think that the week that it was on, uh, on Crate, we sold about $20,000 worth of cord tacos. And it was that moment that I knew I had to change everything. I had to um, not only scale very quickly the way that I was, that I was making these things because I was kind of cutting my, my fingers and, and um, it, it wasn't very pretty for a minute there. Um, but the bigger problem that I had was that, uh, you know, I, I actually needed to scale my, my, my digital presence as well. And that's when we very quickly um, moved out of the Etsy store and moved over to Shopify. Yeah, no, the cool. So you you mentioned something in there. A ton of questions I want to ask you, but you mentioned something in there about how the once you started getting picked up by the big publications, you looked at your current situation as almost. I'm not sure if this is the word you use, but almost like depressing about your setup, about you working a day job and then coming home and working on this at night. What, what about that was? Um, I guess this this concerning to you was it? Did you feel like you didn't deserve this? Like, what was it that you didn't like about the situation? It, it was a, actually more kind of conflict um, and, and not, not really depression. It was the conflict was that I was the co-founder of this, you know, tech accelerator in, in LA and, and we were experiencing a fair amount of success there. And, you know, I would say that my entire design career, I was always messing around with my own businesses and my own products and, the thing that presented conflict for me was that once I was, you know, all of a sudden when I'm super engaged in my day job and I'm, I'm having so much fun and it's so satisfying because the projects like Dollar Shave Club and these other uh, businesses that we were putting out into the world were experiencing success, all of a sudden in my, in my personal life, um, you know, the Cord Taco and this kind of new leather accessories business that I was, that, that was kind of like, you know, hatching was was also experiencing success. So I would say that the, the, the depression I would recategorize as more just kind of I was raw because I wasn't really sleeping. It was intense days and then I would come home to intense nights. But I would say that it was totally worth it. Um, and the the kind of exhaustion and the rawness didn't last long because the, the, the feeling of, you know, seeing people's reactions and reading comments and seeing my favorite blogs kind of pick up the story about the Cord Tacos definitely alleviated any of that and definitely gave me a ton of energy to, to kind of go for it. And so, yeah, it was just kind of, it was just kind of mixed and it was just a, a it was a very exhausting period of time, but definitely worth it. I'm definitely trying, not trying to complain about that period of time. It was just interesting. I think a lot of entrepreneurs out there that are listening have experienced this probably to a smaller degree where you have a lot of great options, but not enough resource, not enough time, not enough time of the day, not enough energy yourself to pursue all of them, even though they all look great. And you ended up having to just say, almost sounds like you said yes to everything that was great when I, I don't blame you because it sounded all amazing opportunities. But it, it, what you gave up in, in, in return for all that was, like you're saying, your health, you didn't get enough sleep, probably really stressed out. And it, it sounds like the reactions from your customers and people that are, you were using your products did give you some boost of energy, but it does still seem kind of short term, right? Because eventually it'll all catch up to you because we're all, it's, we're all human. It's, it, these are physical uh, issues that you can't just um, get rid of, you know, not get enough sleep and being stressed. Um, how did you get through it? How did you get out of this phase or are you still in this phase where you are just getting by on what you're by on your customers' uh, reactions? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm good question. I'm definitely out of that phase. And, you know, I think just to back up a minute, I think that in people's 
careers, you know, when people end up doing what they love to do, um, but then maybe they're doing it maybe at the wrong company or they're doing it on a business where they have a co-founder and it's not healthy or for whatever reason. I, I feel like that, you know, people end up at the end of the day kind of doing what they want to do. And, you know, you can, you can call this moonlighting. You know, I've definitely been there where I've been at more corporate jobs where I kind of moonlight off the side of my desk and I'll work on projects that, you know, kind of give you, you find things that give you energy and give you fuel. And in, and in creativity, um, you know, it's, it's easy to do because you can always work at your day job and then, and then make something else at night that kind of excites you. And in this case, I, I wasn't really in a position where I was looking to moonlight. I was super engaged and super happy at my day job. And then all of a sudden, I, you know, it's kind of like Murphy's law. All of a sudden I launched my own thing accidentally. And the reaction is, is so positive that I continued to just deal with it. I did my day job. I definitely, um, treated the leather accessories opportunity with a lot of respect. And I continued to basically, you know, scale, my ability to manufacture the core tacos, but then I also started just making new products just to see how far the, the love, you know, for what I was creating just to see how far it would go. So the, and, and so I basically what I did was I stayed at my day job. I gave um, my partners a heads up that I had this kind of interesting hobby that was happening and was experiencing a little bit of growth there. And the good news is that my partners were also serial entrepreneurs that, you know, understand that when this kind of thing happens, you have to, it's rare and you have to, you have to ride it out and see, see where it takes you. And so they were definitely supportive. And, uh, so, so the next product that I did after the cord taco was that I was receiving a lot of feedback that they wanted a product that would handle multiple cables, multiple cords for travelers. And so I did a, a roll up, a, a product that was definitely inspired by classic tool roll ups from the past. I just did it for USB cords and, and uh, earbuds and plugs, and I called it the Cordito, just to kind of continue with the, the whole like Mexican food thing that was a lot of fun. And that ended up selling um, just as much, if not more, for a short period of time than the Cord Taco. People were super into the roll up. Again, it was that theory against like something that maybe we're familiar with from the past. And it definitely served a great purpose because you could stuff three cords and a plug in there, roll it up. It was very efficient when it came to using space and it had a fun name. People were really excited about it. So um, I just like over the course of probably six months just started introducing weird little organizers that took care of all of these pesky little technology things that we all had to carry around and uh, just started to kind of in my mind, make that space feel a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And did you have any issues separating the two worlds where you had this day job, but then something that could be possibly even more exciting waiting for you essentially after work? Because I think um, I think a lot of entrepreneurs that are moonlighting, that are working on their business on the side, have this issue that I've heard time and time again, where they are working their day job, but their their minds are consumed by what they're going to do after work, what they're going to do about their you know, actual passion project. Any tips on how to balance that where you just are focusing on what's in front of you rather than being distracted, I guess, when you are at work and your day job being, a, you know, quote unquote, distracted by your true passion? Well, I can, I can share how I dealt with it. And that was that, you know, I'll, I'll, I have to admit I was lucky because I was already working in an environment where we were trying to create, you know, businesses and, and create things. So it was, it was definitely an environment that was, um, friendly for what I was trying to do. And what, what I, you know, my main strategies at that, at that point were number one, you, you know, I was very open about what I was doing and I kind of let everyone know and everyone thought I was a little crazy, which was fine. Um, and, um, you know, the, the next thing that I did was I worked very, very hard on my day job to, um, basically accelerate my own performance to, to try to get everything done as quickly as possible so that I could actually be distracted because I definitely was distracted by it. 
Um, but I, you know, the distraction would occur after my kind of daily responsibilities were, were complete. I was working in an environment where basically my, my task at this accelerator was to, or not task, but my, my whole job was about uh, creating, helping entrepreneurs uh, create stories and which would ultimately help develop their brand and help with user experience design. And so I was, I was like in this sort of mode where I was not only, um, you know, I had to be on my game when it came to creativity, but I had to be on my game for about, you know, sometimes three to five businesses at a time. And so, you know, kind of, bolting in like the cord tacos and the corditos at the end of the day just seemed to be, you know, it was kind of like doing sit-ups at the end of the work workout. It's just like this extra thing that I did. Um, but I also tried to find positivity in what I was doing in my moonlighting thing in the rest of my projects. So I was treating my office almost as a, as a test bed to, to gift the stuff that I was making, the products that I was making in in exchange for feedback. And there was so much delight in my office with me coming around, giving out free leather accessories that there was, there was just a, I tried to bring as much positivity around my distraction into my day job as, as possible, just to sort of balance everything out. Now, not everyone's going to be able to do that because if obviously if you're, you know, working in finance and all of a sudden you create a product, um, you know, maybe the environment isn't as conducive to like being sort of creatively insane at work and, mm-hmm. and going crazy like that. But, but, um, y- you know, I, th- I think that there's a point where when you're doing that, the distraction either becomes something that you, you really want to pursue and take as far as you can and, if, if the distraction is, starts to compete and become more interesting than your day job, then you definitely have a, have a decision to make. And if you can extend that period of time so that you can kind of think it through and work it out so that, you know, there's like a transitional period, then fantastic. If you, if you can't do that and you just have something that takes off, therefore you have to quit your day job in finance, then I, I say you quit your day job in finance because I think those day jobs in finance will always be there. The opportunity mm-hmm. to, you know, um, potentially create some unique product to put it in the marketplace and, and start a brand and ultimately, you know, create, create this, this sort of brand and business around it is, is I think, much harder to do. Mm. So for, I think uh, to maybe sum it up, if you can find ways to positively integrate your your side project, your moonlighting project, your passion project into your day job, then that's obviously the best situation. If you cannot and there is some kind of conflict, like you're saying you're working in a super corporate environment and you're trying to create something creative on the side, try to extend that, that balance as long as possible. But eventually you, you will have to make that decision because it can only be in conflict for so long. I think that's a, that's great advice because there's, you know, I've said this, I've talked about this a lot of times recently about how there's this big movement for everyone to just quit their day job and just jump into whatever they're working on. But sometimes that's not the, the, that's not the only answer. Sometimes that's not the best answer, especially in your situation. It sounded very conducive and very helpful, maybe even for your business to continue to have your day job because you found a way to integrate it. It was set up in a, your, your day job was set up in a way that you could integrate your, your passion project that you're working on on the side. So I like that. Um, so you mentioned something a couple of times already about how when you design something that's functional, it needs to, or it helps a lot to have an element to it that's reminds them of something they're already familiar with. And that really kind of stuck in my head for a bit. So I want to ask you, you know, can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Like, what do you mean by, by that? Well, I think that, you know, if you just look at leather accessories as a whole, I, I don't think before the Cord Taco I ever sat down and really thought why I had an affinity with products made from leather. I don't know that anyone necessarily does, but I think that it's, something that's a bit more wired. We're, we're programmed, you know, as humans, um, to like certain things, you know, we like things that are visual and you can, 
probably theoretically trace them back to the fact that, you know, there was a time when there was no language and we communicated through cave drawings and, you know, leather products. There was a time when you would use hides of some animal of sort as, you know, apparel or protective, you know, gear. So, um, I think the same is to be said about, about products that, you know, you, um, if, if products just seem completely unfamiliar and seem very foreign, you don't, you don't, it takes a while to warm up to them. As a matter of fact, you know, to, to warm up to them, sometimes you have to use it so much that it's, you have to develop a kind of habit and, and, and sort of, you know, mental muscle around usage of, of the product. So if it, if it's something that already feels familiar, um, then, then you already have a head start. And, and so, yeah, in the, in the case of the taco, um, you know, there's, you don't have to train people. There's the learning curve is, you know, not there because people understand the idea of putting something in a taco and closing it. And, you know, so that, that's kind of what I mean by there. And there's a lot of other examples. Um, and actually, um, D- Don Norman wrote a great book about that's called the design of everyday things. And he, he goes into this as well about familiarity with objects that we, we grew up with and how you can apply that familiarity whether, and it doesn't actually have to be the entire product. Sometimes it can just be, you know, objects or industrial designs that because you're used to how something works, you can leverage that model on whatever it is you're designing. Uh, coming up with a series of, you know, new, u- new UIs and, and new, n- new objects to figure out isn't necessarily innovative. It, it sometimes can be, you know, the cause of a lot of frustration. Mm, so I think, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. But because us humans, we like to put things into a box. We like to categorize them in a specific way. So when you come out with a new product... It, it is helpful to tie it back to something that's already familiar so that you can, uh, as a customer, as a potential customer, I can feel familiar with it because it occupies like some, same, some kind of like mind, some kind of space in my mind that says, oh, this is just like this, and then becomes a lot more familiar, a lot more comfortable, and it just maybe even gives you the willingness to be more open to trying out this new product. I think that that's a, I never heard anyone talk about it that way, but when you talk about it, it makes a, a whole lot of sense. So, so definitely something to keep in mind for anyone out there that's thinking about creating a product, make sure that there is some way to tie back to something that they're already familiar with. Um, so you, um, I kind of want to take a step back to the very beginning of how this all kicked off because it sounded, the way you described it sounded just so organic. Like you didn't purposely set out to do any of this. It kind of just fell into place. So I want to make sure I have the timeline right. So you had a you had an Etsy store already, um, and then someone had cre- some uh, po- popular pu- publication included your core taco into their listicle, and then all of a sudden you got a ton of traffic. Other PR pub- other PR outlets picked it up because they saw the the um, the growing popularity of your product, or maybe they saw it on the listicle. Was that the I guess the genesis of the business? Like, did it just really kick off that way? It did, and you know I because I didn't set out to start a business, I I never sat down and created a budget where I had a category for say advertising or Mm -hmm. SEO or any of the more traditional ways that maybe you would, you would seek, um, for the discovery of your product. So it forced me because I didn't have budget for that. It forced me to rely on the, the merits of designing a product that people would have a positive reaction to. And then the even larger challenge was to appeal to social influencers and press and hopefully celebrities because I felt like that would be a shortcut to, to driving, you know, to accelerate the discovery part without paying for advertising. And I, and I didn't even really want to grow a business paying for advertising because I just think that sometimes it's, it's a little misleading to your numbers. If you see this incredible growth, but it's all based on advertising. I I would much rather as an investor, see a ton of growth that's based on 
people discovering a product that they love and then they, you know, buy more and more of that product. And, um, and that's just a bit more natural and organic. So that's the route that we've taken. Mm. So how did you, um, kick it all off? Was it that, was this some publication including you in a listicle, uh, just out of nowhere? Did you, did you have some kind of pitch or reach out to them? How did you kick off this, this, uh, this, I guess, PR? Well, like I said before, my friend was working on the, um, blog post that featured the core taco at first the blog that published it was had enough um, audience to reach editors from other blogs. So other mm-hmm. blogs picked it up, I would say probably three to five decent sized design blogs. And then, and then the design, the, the blog that ultimately put the Cord Taco on the map is I would say probably the number one or two blog for men on the internet. And so that certainly helped. But what helped for me was, you know, when, when you're moonlighting, you're working at a job and you come home at night and you've got this weird business and you're a little raw and feeling a little insecure, you, you get energy off of that kind of recognition from, you know, respectable blogs. So that kind of gave me the confidence to then create another product. And I could say, Hey, I'm, I'm the guy that created the core taco. And I created this other weird thing called the Cordito. And then, and so then I started you know, realizing that I didn't have budget for a a PR agency. So I kind of went the old fashioned route, which is I just made a list of the types of blogs and magazines that I wanted to be in. And then, you know, every one of them has a, a tips link either at the top or the bottom of their webpage. And so I would, you know, I basically just started kind of pitching everything on my own. And what I learned through doing that was that editors, I think actually at the end of the day might appreciate hearing from the founder and the creator of these products more so than being, you know, mass emailed from a PR agency. So the, the, the bootstrapping and the limitations of budget that I had to do all this definitely, I think taught me how to, a a different kind of a hustle and how to just be scrappy and and do it that way. Um, but that's kind of how it started. And, and, and then it became this addictive cycle of, oh, I just launched this product. Oh, I just told a bunch of press about it. Oh, I just saw this spike in sales because of all of the press I just received. And then, and then that's, it, it, you just jump on the merry-go-round. And as holidays come around and as you get bigger and fancier meetings, um, you're, you're, the world just starts to expand and the goals start to expand. And, you, and, and that's when you really go for it. You know? And I definitely you know, I, I made the choice at the beginning because of the reactions that I saw, I, I made the choice to go for it. And so, yeah. yeah. Did you ever feel like you could have been moving too fast? Because it's, it sounds like this all happened in such a short window, right? You had the success with the core taco and then you decided to let's see what would happen if you came out another product, the Cordito, and then you just did it. Did you feel like uh, you it would have been better off if you slowed down or did you feel like you would have missed the opportunity if you didn't move at the speed you did? I had to move fast, actually, because the other thing that I learned is when you do something that's unique, it's going to get knocked off really, really fast. And so I, the original design for the Cord Taco happened actually around the end of 2012. And by the time, I think, what was it, maybe January or February uh, of 2013 came around, someone already told me that they saw a knockoff in Hong Kong. And so... It, you know, that actually is this other thing that forces you to move quickly because if you don't, you're then on the clock, right? You, you're then like, wait a second, I just invented this cord taco. I know I did because I, I, you know, I searched high and low and no one else did it. So I have to make sure that now I take credit for it because if I don't take credit for it, I don't protect my intellectual property, then everyone else is going to kind of come in and, and um, eat my lunch and, and steal it and kind of, you know, that that's that also gets really depressing. That's, it's an emotional uh, thing that happens as well when people knock you off. So you really have to move quick. Um, if you're going to, if you're going to be serious about it and, uh, that, that was a big source of that energy. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I can list off all these products you have, but it does seem like a lot. I'm looking at the site now, a lot of different products that you've created, you've churned out in the last just, you know, three years. Is there, do you, do you, are you at the point now where you found a different strategy or is it just to keep on launching new products to, to establish your, your brand or to establish your place in the market? We definitely sat down at the beginning and decided kind of, you know, what this brand should represent and, and what it should do, which gave us an idea of a path. And it wasn't that we decided to necessarily launch a new product every 90 days. We just knew that if we were going to continue to appeal to the hearts and minds of people in creative arts and people in technology and people in these other fast moving industries that we had to very quickly get all of these lines out because we were a little late to the game. You know, we just started, but we, we didn't, we didn't really want to take the slow route. We wanted to very quickly put stuff out there and get in the game so that people could understand, you know, our, our, our brand and, and what we were trying to do. So, you know, we, we decided that we didn't want to just be small court organizers. So we wanted to go into larger organizers that you could take, you know, on a daily basis to, to meetings or around the city or take on trips on the airplane. Um, and, and then, and then ultimately wanted to get into larger carries as well. So backpacks and weekenders. And so, you know, having, having those goals in mind from the beginning, um, gives you a, you know, allows you to kind of pretty tightly script how you, how you carry this out. And so, the other thing is, is that we, for the most part, the team has grown up in technology. That's my entire background. So I'm actually not used to super long cycles um, for developing products. And, you know, because a lot of our stuff is sort of hitched to the sizing of hardware that companies like Apple will, will launch, you know, we have to be on our game and be ready to launch an iPad Pro case around the same time that it comes out. I think we actually launched our iPad Pro case before the iPad Pro came out. Um, so sometimes we get a little ahead of ourselves and there's some calculated risk there, but it's just, it's a lot of fun. You know, it's, it's also very energizing. We, we um, tend to not overthink and we don't always get it right, but um, when we do and we're right there from the beginning, there's this really nice association with, with all of this stuff that people end up loving to carry. So, so what is your process for discovering and designing and getting these products manufactured? Because again, so many in such a short period of time, uh, I feel like, you know, for any entrepreneur out there that's listening about and thinking about launching their first product that they're creating themselves or thinking about launching a new product line, what's the process that's, that's worked for you guys? Well, we definitely, you know, like I said, we, we have an idea already of the, the lines that we're, we want to create. And for us, it, it always starts with looking, looking into history. And this goes back to you know, leveraging stuff that has already been designed from the past. Because in many ways, that stuff is still very relevant. It could just be that the interior or some things that you know, were envisioned like in the you know, 50s or 40s or whatever, you know, maybe, maybe it just needs sort of a modern update you know? Um, and so we, we typically always start there. Um, the process also involves a lot of, um, identifying problems, existing problems. And, and that comes from observation. It comes from testing. It comes from interviewing. There's a lot of different ways that you can get to what those problems are. We certainly are not an, an arrogant bunch that, that likes to sort of go hide and, and kind of concoct a bunch of problems that don't exist. Um, we definitely pay attention to our community. We have a, a super engaged and opinionated community that helps not only with product design, but also with the naming of products. And we, we like to get them involved um, every step of the way. So once we identify problems that we're, we're trying to solve, you know, it's not unlike any other design process, process you would, you know, you would sort of be familiar with. So there's a lot of sketching. There's a lot of sharing of ideas. There's a lot of critiques, a lot of pitching. Um, my design team is a mix of technology, um, 
industrial design, furniture design, leather accessories, and then apparel. So we have this kind of fashion side as well. And so there's a very um, open, transparent, um, sometimes critical environment <laughs> where we share ideas. And when, when we you know, very quickly come to things that we like, we, we do rapid prototyping. And so we're able to, in our workshop in, in Los Angeles, create, you know, prototypes of, of any of these products. And, and then we essentially take those prototypes and we test them out. Sometimes we'll jump on a, a train, go down to Santa Barbara, head over to Palm Springs or go on little short trips, or we'll, we'll find someone here in the office that's going on a trip and we'll make them a prototype. They'll be sent off with the prototype and they'll go out and basically bust them up and give us notes and tell us what they liked and didn't like. And then, and then we'll revise the prototype and it, depending on what the product is and what the project is, we um, have uh, production facilities now in Los Angeles and in different parts of Italy. So once we have a, a kind of design prototype sample that we feel really good about, we'll then get production involved and then it gets even better because they're familiar with techniques that are beyond you know, our designer's knowledge sometimes. So they'll take a crack at coming up with a version um, that they like, and then we'll test it a bit more. And in some many cases, we we send out testers to our our global community. So for our backpack, for example, we sent ten tester backpacks out to people in in Europe and Japan, Australia, uh, all over the U.S. and even one in South Africa. We sent, and we basically had a way for them to text us uh, pictures and feedback in real time. And we even created a map for that. You can go to venturebackpack.com and see all of that feedback, music they were listening to, things they created all in real time. And so we take that tester part very, very seriously. And, and, then, and then once we have a version that we're excited about, we'll tell production to make a small batch of them. And the reason we do a small batch is that usually that first production run, you're still going to find some issues you know, because this stuff is, is tricky. It's stuff that we carry around on our shoulders. We wear like backpacks. We have, they have handles on them. They're stuffed with thousands of dollars worth of, you know, technology equipment. And we want to make sure this stuff doesn't fall apart and break. So the breaking that happens, hopefully that happens with our smaller, more intimate tester group that is already (laughs) kind of understands that, that that may happen. Um, but by the time, you know, we, we do production runs where we're sending stuff to Apple or one of our other large partners. You know, this stuff has been tested out not only from a, a strength and a, and a usability and, a, and a, um, a utility standpoint, but also just from a more kind of, you know, aesthetic, emotional, kind of visceral, like how does it make you feel? Like all that stuff's been vetted and we're we're pretty, you know, I'll admit we're, we're kind of snobby about not just design in general, but we have such a good, I think, feel on, on what our uh, brand is about and what our design language is about that when something feels just slightly off, you know, it, it'll end up delaying a launch. But, but that's, that's pretty much the overview. Sorry if I went too long there. <laughs> no, no I, I like that. I like that you do have uh, this uh, almost like um, early beta testers to beat up the product to give you feedback before you have a, a much larger production run. Um, and so how do you, because you're saying your products are so hitched to technology, like the I, like the, the iPad and the tech changes so quickly that the, the actual hardware changes so quickly, how do you manage the inventory levels? Like how do you project how much inventory to produce and have on hand? Yeah, that gets pretty tricky. I mean, the way that we dealt with that in the early days was that we, we would not produce inventory. We were a made-to-order business. So mm-hmm. in the early days, you know, we had a factory literally in our, right next to our design workshop. And so when you would buy something on our Shopify site, uh, we would you know, submit an order. We would have a you know, weekend of sales or a week's worth of sales, and we would submit an order to our factory across the hall, and they would make it all very fast. <laughs> and then we would, we would send it out. So 
that that only works in the early days it, when you need to scale your your manufacturing capacity because you're approaching holidays. That's when you actually have to leverage the wonderful reporting that, and analytics that lives inside of Shopify so that you understand which variants, which sizes, which colors are going to sell. And that's when you need to take a, a slightly larger bet and produce inventory. And, and so, you know, now that we've been doing this for a couple of years, we have really wonderful data that, and, and his, you know, historical data that can give us a sense for what color is going to sell um, and, and stuff that lives within our own domain. Now, the stuff that we can't predict is when Apple launches an iPad Pro or a new product, you know, obviously we don't know what that pickup is going to be like. So certainly that, that will, will dictate a lot of this, and that's where some of the unpredictability comes into play. But when we have like a hunch that you know maybe it's something that we should wait and until there's a little bit more data around, um, then we have no problem waiting. We still haven't done anything for the the Apple Watch. We certainly have gone deep with the tablet and the laptop and the phone because those are things that you know they predated our brand, so it was easier to start making stuff for that. But now we have to look ahead to a world that potentially doesn't have cords attached to their in-ear headphones. And so, you know, we have to, we have to be in front of that and sort of embrace the ambiguity of, of not knowing whether that's real or fake. Um, but either way, we end up making stuff that, you know, we'll find something. There's a lot of, there's a lot of gadgets, a lot of gear out there that uh, people end up using our stuff for. So it's, um, it's good. We have, a, we have a lot of market indicators out there and the majority of the time they're, they're pretty close. Um, but we manage it. We, ma- we manage how deep we go on stuff for sure. Mm-hmm. So one of the, uh, I think we'll close out on this. One of, one of the questions I asked in the pre-interview was about your most successful marketing strategy. And you, you had said that when it comes to marketing your brand, it's been through storytelling, through interviews you know, like this, uh, through Medium and other platforms. Can you say a little bit more about that? Like, How, do you, how did you come up with, I'm not sure if there is a, a step-by-step approach to this, but if there is, I'd love to hear from you. Like, what has been your approach to coming up with a story and then how to tell that story? One of the trickiest things is to get to a point where you do enough self-reflection or, or therapy <laughs> to know what the genesis to all of this is, you know? And I don't really think I realized why or how this business came to be until I really, you know, stopped and and looked at, you know, my history of like how I got to that point. And, you know, it it might help to kind of tell a little bit of that story. And, and, you know, it kind of starts with the name, this is ground. So the name, this is ground, um, the origin of that comes from when I, in my early twenties, I was on a, a tour with an advertising blimp. So, you know, the blimps that fly over football games and, and race car, you know, uh, NASCAR races, I was, I was on tour with that thing. And, and so I would communicate with the pilot by saying five sixty alpha Bravo, this is ground. And when I had to come up with a name for my very first online shop, it was, it was kind of that coupled with, you know, one of my favorite David Bowie songs um, that, that has This Is Ground as part of the lyrics. And, and there were some other things in there, but I mean, those were the kind of main points. And when I, when I kind of really looked at the, the origin of the whole brand, it did stem from those early days on tour with the blimp because it was those days on, on that tour when I really became more adventurous. I was traveling. I was organizing very obscure uh, gear, helium hoses, helium tanks, stuff that you need on a blimp operation. And it was really difficult to, to be efficient with space and time when you're on a blimp tour. And so I, I learned quite a bit about, you know, how to do that. And, and a lot of that carried over into, into this brand because, you know, while it's not helium hoses, um, it, it is cords and it's stuff that actually we all use now. So, um, that story coupled with, uh, my my experience working in technology in Silicon Valley and in San Francisco, um, when I put all of that together, I you know it took a few friends to say, hey, that's really interesting. You should definitely share that 
out because it, quite honestly, like the cord taco is fun and all, but sometimes the origin and the story behind it is really, really engaging and it probably will open up more opportunities. And so when I started telling that story, um, I did hear from people, people in our community that bought a few of our products, they started to reach out to me just telling me how engaged they were and inspired by, by the story because it didn't really seem like it was necessarily, it seemed like it was an un- unorthodox path to get to a point where I had a business and a brand, but, but it, when it was there, when it was time, it's not like a, it was forced. It was this sort of, you know, combination of a whole bunch of stories, a whole bunch of experiences. And then all of a sudden when everything was aligned perfectly, it just happened. It had to happen. You know, it was, it was the time. And so I, I think that those stories are, are helpful for people that might feel like they're stuck at their day jobs. I think they have been inspiring to some other people and, you know, it's, it's fun to help people see beyond something that might seem like this, like they're spinning or they're going to, you know, the same groundhog day, same thing every day. It, it's helpful. And so I think that it becomes this higher order thing. It's not just selling cord tacos day after day. Like that part to me, I don't want to seem complacent, but that almost is, is easier. But, but reaching people on an emotional level to where they engage on a, on a deeper level with me and the brand, I just think that that's, that's more important. And, and then the rest of it will come. But, but that's, the, you know, to me, the higher order thing and the more interesting thing that's happened is connecting with this community through the stories. Mm. And it sounds like a lot of times you're just telling your story, right? Your own personal story that you've gone through and not so much. Because I think a lot of times when people think about uh, the storytelling or telling the story, they think about telling the story of their brand and not so much the people behind it. But it sounds like your approach has been make it personal, make it about you, make it about the people that are creating this company that are behind this brand. Yeah, and I think if you look around, you know, there's some really wonderful stories. One of my favorite stories is about the Grado family who's been making audio equipment out of their home in Brooklyn, you know, for 50 years, 50 plus years. There, there are stories like that that I actually believe exist, but maybe founders and entrepreneurs haven't quite sussed it out to the point where they know, know how to tell it. Mine actually goes even deeper, but we'd have to have a cocktail for me to, you know, really kind of get into it. But, but it, I I think that those stories are, it's kind of like when you watch a documentary that you didn't really set out to watch. Maybe you press the wrong button on an airplane and all of a sudden you're watching a documentary on how candy is made. And it might seem like this kind of brainless thing, but it just somehow is super interesting. Just learning about what goes into something, learning about how something came to be. I, I, I just always think that it's fascinating and it's, um, and the, and the human stories to me, you know, um, like the Anthony Bourdain's of the world that, that go around and tell these human stories. It's not about the food. It's, it's about culture and it's about mm-hmm. the people that live in these places. That to me is, is just much more interesting. So, yeah. And I think it's going to be a lot more interesting to, to the customers too, as your potential customers, because they, uh, that, that personal connection you can tie with them, I think goes, it goes a long way. Um, so you know, thanks so much for your time, Mike. So this is ground.com is the website. Um, what, what do you have planned? What do you have planned for the rest of this year into next year? Like what do you, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you have a ton of products that you guys are thinking about churning out and I'm sure you can't really, really divulge all of them, but what are the, the plans for the business? Yeah, I mean, you know, this is a fun time of the year for us because this is when we put a lot of our new products into testing um, because people are traveling. And so if you look close enough out there, you might catch a prototype of ours out on vacation somewhere. And then and then in August and September, we, we process all of that, update our products. And then all of a sudden, um, we have a bunch of new products that we release um, when it's back to school and in October and definitely for holidays. So we're in this like really fun period of time where we just gave birth to a whole bunch of prototypes. We're seeing them develop. We're making some tweaks. And, um, so, so that, this is a really fun time of the year for us. And we also get a chance to travel ourselves a bit and and test these guys out. So, um, a lot more to come, a lot more partnerships with great companies like, um, like tile and karma. So we'll, we'll definitely be, um, including some really interesting technology 
um, options in our, in our, in our gear and, and, um, meeting more brands and more people that have ideas or stories to share. And, uh, yeah, just looking for more ways to, to get the word out about what we're up to. Awesome. So what's the best place for people to stay up to date on this stuff? I know you mentioned uh, VentureBackpack.com is one. ThisIsGround.com obviously is the store. Anywhere else you recommend uh, listeners check out? Yeah, I think if you go to ThisIsGround.info or ThisIsGround.com, um, those are really two great sources of, of information ab- about, about our stuff. And then reaching out to us over our social channels. The main one's probably Instagram, of course. You know, that's a great way to connect with us. But we're, we're very approachable, very accessible. We have a small team here in LA. Um, we're just at info at thisisground.com if you want to email us. And yeah, we, we love the, again, the human side of this is our favorite part. So anyone out there wants to collaborate or has more questions or product ideas, by all means, please reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Mike. Thanks, Felix. Thanks for listening to Shopify Masters, the e-commerce marketing podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs. To start your store today, visit shopify.com slash masters to claim your extended 30-day free trial.